Uh, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to join with you. I'm going to start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into where we might go today. Loving God, we thank you that you are the God of all nations, of all people, and the God of all time. We recognise we come before you. We'll never anything like fully comprehend you and your purposes, but what we see and know is good. We pray that through your spirit you would help us to understand this part of the Bible a bit better. Help us to see it as your living word that continues to speak to us today. And may in your grace we respond in ways which honour you and which are pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, as Bill said, I am a, an Anglican minister and uh, I do have a various responsibilities across the city of Adelaide and the Anglican churches as uh, an assistant bishop. I bring you greetings from uh, the extended family of the Anglican church. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You could sort of describe us as cousins in some way. So uh, uh, we do bring our uh, greetings and I do appreciate the chance to join with you and to hear about your vision and your ministry, which is uh, very exciting. Anyone here planned a, a significant journey overseas at some stage? Anyone actually done some planning for an overseas trip? Okay. Well, that's sort of like my job today, I think, is that uh, you're about to have a journey in coming weeks through these letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And I understand you're reading your way through Revelation for those who have some journals as part of your process for that. So uh, part of my job, I think, is to be a bit of a tour guide and to help in the planning of the trip. When you're going to somewhere that is perhaps not as familiar territory, I'll be working through, well, where is this part of the world? Where within the Bible do we find these passages in Revelation? And what's going on there? So uh, part of what I'm looking to do is to prepare for the trip in coming weeks. And you're in, in for an exciting time because they are incredibly rich and exciting parts of Scripture. And the book of Revelation is an incredibly exciting book within Scripture. Who's had a go at reading the book of Revelation? I know some of you are doing it for the journey. And as it progresses, who's found it a little bit weird challenging, not quite sure what's going on there. Um, and it can be off-putting. There are some people in the past, uh, John Calvin, one of the great reformers, put a commentary out on every book of the New Testament, except for Revelation. <laughs> he said, I just don't get it. Martin Luther, much the same, said, lots of New Testament is terrific, but I don't get Revelation as much. But actually, in recent years, and talking about the last 50 years or so, um, in the area of uh, academic studies, part of my life is as a, as a teacher and as an academic, has actually opened up the book of Revelation in incredibly helpful ways. And what I want to bring to you today a little bit is about what's been uh, helpful about that, that helps us reading it as God's living word that continues to speak to us as well. So uh, part of my job will be as a tour guide, but I also want to prepare you as part of this tour to experience a drama. Um, about six months ago, my wife Fiona and I went over to Melbourne. Going to Melbourne wasn't a big trip. We sort of knew where we were going and, uh, and so on, but we're planning a nice weekend for it. And we went to see West Side Story. And uh, part of the experience was preparing ourselves, getting ourselves into the right space so that when we came in, we really appreciated the, the music and the dance and uh, all that went with that. Um, for me, it was actually a bit of a nostalgia trip because when I was back in high school quite a few years ago, um, our school did a production of West Side Story and we did it with a local girls' school as well. So it was a big social event in which they got together to do West Side Story. I didn't actually tell Fiona part, that part of it, but anyway. Um, so it evoked a lot of the memories of the excitement going with it. Well... Something of that drama is what we experience in the book of Revelation. Where do we find Revelation? Well, it's actually one of the easiest books to find if you have to do, you know when you find those obscure minor prophets and things you've got to go to the index or work you through and find your way? Revelation is the easiest, it's probably as easy as the book of Genesis because it's right at the end, literally at the end of the Bible. And it is incredibly rich for 
a couple of reasons. One is it's at the end of the New Testament. Now, in previous weeks, and I've been hearing about the various ways you've remembered and celebrated um, and reflected upon the events uh, leading up to Easter, Palm Sunday and the palms and the incredible energy as the various pilgrims travelled up towards Jerusalem, waving their branches, recognising in Jesus as someone special and joining in the, the songs of Hosanna. They sang as they went, they sang psalms, and Jesus entered with all that enthusiasm and excitement. We've gone through the events of what we in the Anglican Church call Holy Week, because it's a week unlike any other. Jesus sat as a teacher in the temple forecourts and engaged with various people challenging him. And they were public challenges, as, uh, almost like Monty Python it's at times. You know, when you go up and you slap someone in the face and you step back and they slap you back. In the ancient world, that was actually entertainment. Uh, they didn't have all their Xboxes and Playstations or other stuff to go to. So if you wanted some entertainment, you go down to the local forum and there'll be a... a, a, st a, a a challenge and riposte is the term it's used. If someone would throw down a verbal challenge to some speaker and say, what do you say to that? Then the speaker would come back. And throughout that week, as Jesus was in the forecourts teaching as the Messiah, as the Son of God, various challenges came up and they got their most difficult curly questions to throw at Jesus. And time after time, Jesus said, I'm not even going to dignify your response by playing a game, he just cut through the question and left them quiet and chastened and wondering what they could say or do next. That all happens in that amazing final week leading up to Jesus' gathering of his disciples for the Passover, turning an event into the Last Supper where Jesus took the symbol of the cups and the wines and the Passover and said, I'm giving this a whole new meaning because what is about to happen, the hour has now come and this blood, this wine and this bread represents my blood that will be shed and my body that will be given, that the new community can be gathered and so the Spirit can come and take this whole resurrected body of my people. So it's been a solemn journey through that until as I was preaching on Easter Day, Sunday, Easter Sunday, and as I was rehearsing a little bit of all that and the excitement and all the resources, and I said, quite literally, thank God it's Easter. <laughs> and not just in terms of our energy levels, but because in the midst of all that messiness and darkness and confrontation and betrayal and corrupt politics and terrorism, that's the event of Good Friday. The light shines through that darkness and has defeated it and gives us hope. Hope that's come at an incredible cost, cost that we cannot really begin to imagine, but hope that becomes ours and all that emerges. So we've been through a journey that I'm sure in each of us do in different ways have been through that. You know sometimes when you see a, might be a movie or at, um, my wife Fiona and I a number of years ago watched a series called Parenthood um, that goes over, um, have a, some of the special needs and things which we related to. And I uh, went through five or six seasons, I've forgotten what it ended up with. And the, they announced the final season. So they go through the final season and of course they have all the dramas and all that goes with all that. Um, and at this stage, because we've got to know the characters so well, we were living with them, all their pains and their joys and all the, the whole mix. And they get to the stage, how do you have your final episode <laughs> to wind it off? And they had a really good final episode. And in the midst of that, the very final scene, they fast forwarded 10 years and just gave you little glimpses. Didn't have commentary, but just glimpses of what was happening in this family through 10 years later down the track. Just enough to be suggestive, just enough to give you some ideas of uh, uh, where their lives were heading and the challenges and to see the little babies now growing up into older children. The book of Revelation, and especially those opening chapters, are like that epilogue scene to the New Testament. They'd been through Easter. Some had actually had been there. Others had heard the stories of Easter, had come to faith. Then it's as if they jump us forward a whole generation 
and look at those seven churches and saying, what's happening in those churches one generation later? And little glimpses of them as they go through. And they have a really powerful role to play. I mean, imagine being one of the lucky chosen seven churches to be a case study for the rest of history. You know, that imagine God chose seven churches in Adelaide to say, now you seven churches, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to give you a report card of how you're doing and what others could learn from, from what you're doing well and what can you learn from what you're not doing well. I'm not sure I'll be jumping up to say, yeah, look at my church. But through those churches, we see ourselves. We see ourselves personally and we see ourselves as church communities. So part of our engaging with this text is to understand that these aren't just another world, another time, another place. This is our world and people with all the strengths and weaknesses and the triumphs and the joys and the tears and the griefs and the questions and the whole mix that goes with being human, being a follower of Christ and being a church of Christ. And God speaks to us. Christ speaks to each of those churches and continues to speak to us through those words as well. But not only is the book of Revelation a end piece for the whole New Testament, like an epilogue, and it's not just a, a, a quiet epilogue, it actually opens up an amazingly bigger picture. Because alongside the stories of those seven churches, and I'll unpack it a little bit more and actually how it's expressed in Revelation, there is an even greater vision opened up. A vision not just of heaven, but of the fullness of history. It's actually an appropriate final word in Scripture itself. The amazing book of Scripture and all its stories and the great heroes of, and, uh, and flawed people of Adam and Moses and Sarah and Miriam and uh, the whole mix of all those who have their stories coming into the New Testament... Can you imagine if you're an author thinking, how am I going to finish this work off? <laughs> Not that we can imagine writing scripture, but you would know, how can we bring this to a view that challenges, brings hope, but actually gives a vision of something so much bigger? So whatever else you do when you read your way through Revelation, there are a few chapters I would suggest you can fast track through. It's designed to actually move over you. Don't get too caught up in the details. But whatever you do, get to chapters 21 and 22. Because there we have a breathtaking image as though all the different storylines running throughout Scripture are gathered together. And God says, this is where it is heading. This is the greater reality that lies before you. This is your inheritance as one of my people. And whatever we go through life, whatever path it takes, this is where that path is taking you. And once you see that, you find hope and purpose for where we are now in our present reality. So it's an amazing book, and you're in for exciting times in and through it. So, into my task as a bit of a tour guide into this book of Revelation. If I could turn this on, that would help. Okay, turning it on is a good start. Okay. Locating this book of Revelation, well, I found where it is in the Bible, it's right at the end, it's the end of the New Testament, in fact, it's the end of the Bible, and it is set in the Roman province of Asia, which is in western Turkey. Uh, the word Asia is used in the ancient world describing what we would call modern Turkey. And again, that's incredibly relevant to our understanding of the world today, because western Turkey and the various locations that these churches are identified with within this province are precisely where the, the refugees from Syria are gathering and getting into very precarious boats and trying to make their way over to the Greek islands to find a foothold to getting into, into Europe. This is very much part of our modern world and the sort of movement and questions and fears and anxieties that are happening in that part of the world were happening back then, as they do continue to happen today. So where you see the, the stories of people launching out on tiny little boats and all those sort of areas, chances are they're actually coming from exactly the same part of the world. What's happening in the background is a much bigger story that the Roman world thought was the big story. 
This is a story that everyone needed to hear and to respond to. It's the rise in emperor worship. Now, the word emperor and the Roman Empire, they said in the late first century, historians, I'm an ancient historian by training, um, get excited about this because Rome had moved from being a republic to an empire. And you think, woohoo, what does that mean? Um, short version, very short version. Uh, the first century before Christ was a bloody century, literally, because it was a century of civil war. Rome was turning in on itself. Their culture said, no one must rise to be the first man in Rome. We have a very elaborate system of being a republic that makes sure that no one gets ahead of themselves. That was a dismal disaster that led to continual battles, Julius Caesar, Augustus and all those sort of figures. At the end of that, one figure emerged, Augustus, he was given the name, his actual name was Octavian, but he was given the name August. So we get our month from, the month of August. And Augustus means revered. Why was he revered? Because he emerged as the one who brought peace to the world. Pax Romana, he dealt with the terrorists, he dealt with the brigands, he dealt with the pirates. He is the one who saved this time of civil war and brought peace to Rome. He was deified. So his son Tiberius received a title which he alone could have the title of the deified Augustus, otherwise known as the Son of God. So in the first century, the time of Christ, a lot of propaganda was going around all the towns and cities that this is our best hope. This is who is to be trusted. This is the one to whom you must give your complete loyalty. And if you are to be faithful to our village, if you are to be faithful to our city, then you must join us in entering into emperor worship, that we would honour our emperor as Lord and Master, as Saviour, as Son of God, the one who brings peace to the world. Do those terms sound familiar? What we see happening in the Gospels, what we see happening in the New Testament and what we see happening in the book of Revelation is responding to that propaganda and said, do you think that is a real victory? Do you think that is real hope? Do you think that is what, where the future of our world is to be found? Let us tell you about the real good news. Because the same term was used of Augustus. The propagandists for Augustus were evangelists who brought the good news of Augustus or the emperor's latest victory. And they said, don't buy into that. The real good news, the real Lord, the real saviour, the only one who can bring peace to this world isn't named Caesar. It is named Jesus Christ. So that is what dominates the book of Revelation. It tells you why don't get caught into the false hopes, the false messages that the Roman Empire and their propaganda machine is trying to sell on you. Every narrative needs to wind its way back to the person of Jesus Christ. For that reason, on Easter Day, as I had the honour of preaching in the church I happened to be at, did confirmations and saw people honoured in their faith and their commitments, I said what I truly believe. The reason I'm a follower of Christ, the reason I'm in ministry, the reason I stand before you and I'm happy to do so anywhere in our wider community to commend our Christian faith is not because I've got it better, I've got the answers, I've got it all sorted, look at me, I've got the model life, because my family will soon tell you, no, 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 no. <laughs> but in God's grace, I have seen that the person of Jesus has done more for this world than any other person in history. I've seen that the person of Jesus is doing more for this world than any other person in history. And as I hear the horrific stories we see from overseas and the acts of terrorism and all that is, can only be described as evil and the fearful future that people look at, I honestly believe that the only person who can bring light in that darkness, hope 
in the midst of that otherwise despair, who is to be trusted for his faithfulness and his love above anyone else in all history, is the person of Jesus. That is the message of Revelation. Let me just unpack a little bit how it comes. Now, the challenge is that bigger picture in a glimpse, and I'll just show you that as we get to locating it. So this is the ancient world, um, still the very much the modern world, Macedonia um, and Archaea and the various provinces, and you see Asia is right in the centre of there. And in that centre, which is now western Turkey, uh, there's a region that uh, the seven churches are located within. It's one thing to locate Revelation right, written in a particular place in a time to particular churches, and we know more about those churches now than has been known previously. And that's been one of the most exciting things across the seven churches. You, you know that the letter, the who wrote the letter, um, speaks to an uncanny un understanding of what was happening in those cities. But how do we read Revelation? As you read through it in your journals, or those you're doing the life journals, and as you hear it in, in church reflected on. First of all, Revelation is a drama more than a text. The idea of reading God's Word out of a book actually is a modern innovation. It's only been around for 500 years. For 1,500 of those years, before then, it was heard. Now, it's a great benefit for us to have printed text that we can read at home and, ex and study and explore, but we need to learn to hear God's Word, literally hear it, as a performance. Because the book of Revelation is not given for us of a pause button that we can dissect each verse and go back and turn that verse upside down and inside out and look at this word and so on. It's a drama that it waves over us. It is performed rather than dissected. So if we read Revelation trying to think, it's stop, we've got to work out exactly what this image is talking about, exactly what's going on here, as though it's a jigsaw puzzle we have to put together, then we'll get ourselves into all sorts of difficulties. It actually says, blessed is the one who reads this word in chapter 1. doesn't talk about the one who reads it privately. It's talking about the one who reads it, performs it before the church community. Blessed are they who perform this word. Now, I'm a very visual person. Um, I have to turn my, close my eyes because it's just one of those bizarre characteristics. Those who are teachers will know that you can be visual, oral, read, write, and, can, and all that different ways that we learn. I learn visually. So rich is it that when I'm um, processing information, the visual is so strong, I don't hear anything. There's a little slide that I showed to some of my students. I showed them last week and they roared with laughter. Uh, visual learning was very high. Oral was zero. Read-write was quite high and kinesthetic was actually reasonably high as well. As I often say, Fiona could have told you that. I just don't listen. Um, <laughs> so what I want you to do for a moment, just, just humour me with this. Close your eyes. And I want to walk you through how we might hear the drama of Revelation rather than reading it off a flat page. Imagine you're coming into an amphitheatre or a theatre like, just like the church here. And as you come in, it's all in darkness. And you come and find your way and you've found a group of people who are like yourself. And on the stage, a shadowy figure, an old figure, starts the role as a narrator. And he says that I was on an island of Patmos and the Lord spoke to me. And opened up for me for things that are just so wonderful. I want to tell you about what I saw as the Lord spoke to me. And as this narrator speaks, a, a, a larger figure, a brighter figure, emerges behind him. So much so that the role of the narrator almost goes to the back of the stage. And suddenly the presence, your eye is drawn to this amazing figure who conveys a quality of life that is bright, that is vital, vitality, has such authority and power and love who speaks. We're drawn to the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. We're drawn to the letter A and the letter Z 
and everything that comes in between. And this figure speaks. And when I hear this figure speaking, I know that there's no arguing back. I'm listening to the words of truth, of life, of what life is about, of purpose, of hope, of assurance, and of warning. Now imagine in front of us, the spotlight goes on a little side stage and we see a church, a church that's gathering next generation. And this voice of Jesus says, I know you. I know you by name. And I like these things I see about you. But there's some things I'm also seeing about you that I don't like. And I want you to hear me. You need to set aside from those things that I don't like and trust me and be faithful to me. Then the spotlight moves to another church and says, you're a small struggling church. It's been so hard for you. The world around you is so aggressive. It's been really costly for you to follow me. But I want you to know that I know you. I'm in your midst and you will prevail. And so the spotlight moves to another series of churches. It comes to a bigger church and says, I know you as a church, you have wonderful programs and activities and so much happening and there's been so much growth. But in the midst of all that, there are some things that you need to be aware of. And so it moves across those seven churches. Then imagine that suddenly the centre stage lights up. And on that centre stage is a band, totally in tune, with an amazing choir, singing this most wonderful image of, uh, of music. And around the centre stage is a scene. The scene is the throne of God, the centre of the universe. And all gathered around it are all the representatives of every realm of the whole cosmos. The angels are there, those who are messengers and intermediaries and representatives of the whole creation are there, bowing down into the stunning scene of God, and God in all his glory. And at the center, there is a figure. There's a scroll. And in that scroll are seven seals. And the scroll holds the future for all history. It unlays what God's purposes are and where they are going. But there's a problem. No one is worthy to open the scroll. So a great cry goes up. There's grief. Who is worthy to open this scroll that unlocks all the future? Then the choir chimes up. And a speaker in the choir says, the worship leader in the choir says, there is one who is worthy. worthy. He is the lion, the tribe of Judah. So where is he? He is that slain lamb who is now standing and is alive, whose name is Jesus. He alone is worthy. And so the choir goes into songs of blessing and honour and glory and power. For worthy is the Lamb. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so it continues. That's giving you a bit of a, a feel for how Revelation works. As we see those seven little church communities, we see ourselves in those communities. But God speaks to them in a way that he continues to speak to us today. My hope is that through today, you'll go back and reread Revelation with fresh eyes and to feel it. It is evocative rather than literary. It's something that we need our imaginations to get drawn into rather than switching our mind into this has got to be decoded in some way. It's not something to be decoded. It's a drama to to wash over us. And as we do so, we realise we aren't watching on from a distance. We are part of that gathering. We are one of those churches. But those churches are being invited to come up onto centre stage and to see ourselves as part of a, a gathering as not just those seven churches, but churches throughout the ages gather on centre stage. So by the end of Revelation, they are representatives, not just representatives, they are the totality of all the members of this church will be there. 
And in God's grace, churches from around the world will be gathered together and drawn into the most amazing unison of our worship that there is only one who is worthy of our praise and honour, only one who is worthy of our trust and our faith. That is the drama of Revelation. Now, those who know me um, um, in my teaching life, as I like to be able to resolve everything in a PowerPoint, and this is this one single PowerPoint that is the guide to all of Revelation, very humble approach as we go. I did tell you I was, I was very visual, and another version this actually has it all moving and there's a drama around it, but it doesn't really matter. Chapter 1, on the top left corner, is where the Alpha and the Omega speaks. Chapter 1 is where the God who no one can challenge because it is his truth, his authority, his stature is just real and manifest. There will be no new atheist challenging him to saying, but you don't exist. God exists. <laughs> he says, I'm speaking and I want you to listen. He speaks to the seven churches and those seven churches are indicative of all churches throughout the ages. It isn't just about those particular seven churches that, uh, you know, for them at that time. This is for all churches. This is including your church and my church and our churches collectively. Then in chapters 4 to 7 get to that scene where the centre stage opens up. Heaven's doors are opened and ultimate truth and worship is given and they provide a commentary, an explanation to those seven churches. This is what is going on. This is why you're being persecuted. There's a great cosmic battle going on. And there are those who are opposed to the work of God and you're drawn into it. You're on the front line of those battles. You need to know that. And the choir provide the constant recentering as it continues. For the, 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 as the scroll is opened, there are seven seals on the scrolls. They lead to seven trumpets, to seven visions, to seven bowls. They're highly figurative, symbolic ones. And they're pretty scary reading. It's all the horses and all the part of Revelation we get stuck on. It is intentionally very uh, symbolic uh, as it reads. And we ask ourselves, oh, what's going on here? Was that back in the first century? Is that happening now? What's well, actually was happening in the first century, second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century, right through to the present time. It was true at the times of the, the Great Inquisition. It was true at the times of the Reformation. It was true of the Napoleonic period. It was true of early, uh, during the First World War, people read it and saying, this is so true of what's going on in the First World War. Then the Second World War came along and said, oh, hang on, that's true of that as well. It is true of every age in this period we call the last days. And the last days run from the time of Christ until his return in glory to take his seat in the new creation. This is history as we experience it in a very intensified version. And there's a little bit of movement. As they go progressively, they head closer and closer to that end time period. But notice the arrows also push back in the other way. It is the future racing to reach us in the present. So we see the glimpses of what lies ahead and we realise that what lies ahead is breaking into the present and changing it. Do you know what happens when we gather on church on a Sunday morning, when you gather here on church on Sunday morning? You are a little glimpse of what lies ahead. And your ministry of music and prayer and teaching and the worship that surrounds it all is a reminder of truths like the seven churches need to hear. That's why the music tells us salvation belongs to our God. He is worthy. And it's great to be drawn into that ministry of music to remind us, to recenter ourselves week by week. That is the greater reality. We must never lose sight of it. Otherwise, we will be led to despair and wonder where hope is to be found. But it is all heading to these final two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22. And there it is. It takes us right back to the beginning of creation. The light and the darkness that was hovering over the earth and the emergence of order and of, of, of a fruitful garden. It takes us and says, what does that garden look like now? Well, it's bursting with fruit around this river. And it's a place of complete harmony and of trust and of, of uh, nothing to fear, of wholeness. There's a wonderful biblical word for it. It's called shalom. All that the world was created to be and to become is captured. And why is it so rich? Why is it such a wonderful place? because we're drawn into the dwelling place of God. We are now in the garden where God lives. He watches over us. There'll be no more tears, no more suffering. 
in the most amazing image, I find anyway, that the God of all creation, of the cosmos, of our all history, knows us by name and reaches down and wipes away tears under our eyes. Isn't that the most wonderful image of where we are found within that story? So, this is what lies ahead as you explore the way through Revelation. These are the seven churches in this province of uh, uh, Western Turkey. And uh, Ephesus, you see there, is at the centre. It was the capital. And pretty much the route that goes around the order of the churches is the order of a postal journey. A postman's going out delivering these letters from Christ to the churches as he goes. But letters for the public reading as it goes. I want to finish up with by looking at... Um, the first of those stops, and I'll leave you at that stage. And the tour guide takes you to the first stop, and I'm going to jump off the bus, and Bill's going to come up next week and continue the journey, I think. Is that my understanding? Um, so we, th- these are speaking to the realities of the world then and now. And in our imagination, we could wonder what would come up if the Lord wrote a letter to this church. I'm not sure I'll be jumping up to offer for that, because there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> These letters, um, one to Ephesus in particular, was written to a, uh, a major centre city. It was, if you want to compare it to an Australian city, Ephesus, which is the first of those cities, was like, is like Brisbane. It hasn't got quite the longer pedigree in history that some of uh, Sydney and Melbourne think they have. Um, compare that to Indigenous people, they'll tell you that's not a history. We'll tell you what real history looks like. But they had an economy, they were well connected, they were a centre of trade and so on. And uh, a church was established within it. What do we know about Ephesus? Well, we know that they had one boast that no other city in that region could boast of. And uh, this is a reconstruction. You can see a little uh, figure, a friend of mine uh, called Bruce Winter. He's a, he's a reasonably sized guy, but it's a pretty big, significant column, isn't it? and actually was only discovered about 100 years ago, but we knew about this temple because that was just one column amongst all those columns. This was one of the wonders of the world. If you know the uh, Parthenon in Athens, you've seen that image? This was four times bigger than the Parthenon. It's the temple of Artemis. The Roman name is of uh, Diana. And uh, people would travel from all over to the temple of Artemis, and there's a whole cult of of, uh, spiritual power was promoted through it. They could provide fertility and and, uh, lots of answers to things. And it became a real challenge if you read the narratives around how the gospel took place. It was so successful that all the people who were selling things for that temple um, were complaining that the church is ruining our business because they're all now reading and hearing about Christ, if you read the narrative in Acts. Well, what happened to that church? You can still visit Ephesus now. It's actually quite a good journey. Um, And uh, we'll get to the epilogue in a minute. So as we look at these seven churches, they all have a consistent shape. As you read them, it starts off with a wonderful description of Christ. Each of them are different. And that in itself is a great study. Just go through and see what are we being told about Christ just from the one who's identifying themselves. Then they go through a part where there's an I know. I know you. There are good things happening in your church. You have some wonderful ministries. You care for a whole range of people. You speak the work of Christ and people will come to know you. And there are words of assurance. God knows and he's with you. More than with you, he's working in and through you. And then in the letters, all but one, there is a little word, but... And that's the moment you sort of cringe. Okay, but what's coming next? But I also know that you have failures and weaknesses. And we know that's true. And that is, God says, I know. And I'm not happy. You need to do something about these. I'm not going to say they don't matter, just forget about it. God says, no, they do matter. You need to do things about it. In six out of the seven churches, there's a but. One of them is so small and so frail and being persecuted. God just says, I know you. Just hang in there and persevere. And there's words of rebuke and a warning. And then there is a response to be made. This is one of those messages that requires a response. You know, different types of news. 
there was a certain football match yesterday afternoon, I gather, and there's a result to that. I mean, I'm a humble Kiwi, I don't really care unless it was the All Blacks, but uh, I gather locally was a bit more involved in that. But it's not going to change your life. You know, you're not going to go through and, and be so devastated if you're a port supporter or so triumphant that the rest of the world is all fine. You might get a glow for a week until next week's game. Then there might be some news that comes, you know, someone comes to will tell you, oh, your home's on fire. That sort of news, I don't take like a sports report. I don't think, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah, my home's on fire. Can you describe it for me? Yeah, there's flames going out the window. Oh, that's really interesting. That sort of news you need to respond to quickly. Bring the fire brigade. And this is the sort of news and message we're hearing in these seven churches. Saying, hear, understand, and respond. And the response is a personal response. And the response is a church response. Because you're all in this together and responsible for each other. In salvation... Faith is personal and communal, but never individual. God knows us personally by name and relate to him personally. God works with us through communities that we gather us to be. But it is never, commu- never individual, because an individual says, it's just between me and God, and it doesn't worry about other relationships. And God says, no, you can't do that. You have brothers and sisters. <laughs> you have neighbours. They matter. So it may be that as you reflect on this, and I'm going to come for the passage without any great explanation, my goal was that you just hear the word speak for itself as God's living word speaking today. But I wonder whether there are some here who are thinking, my faith is a bit like the faith in the Ephesian church. It's not as strong as it used to be. And perhaps I'm becoming too complacent or too overwhelmed or whatever it may be, too distracted. And I need to renew my commitment personally and as a church. Or it could be others who are saying, I've heard a whole range of messages in the wider world and different people making promises that this is the way to live and this is what the good life lives like. And now that I'm getting involved in a church, I'm understanding I'm talking an awful lot about the person Jesus. And I've got to the stage and I think, I need to make that personal response to Jesus. I need to be clear in my loyalty, saying, yes, he is the one that I'll listen to over anyone else. He is the one I trust with my future. He is the one who has done more for me in this world. He is the one who has shown me what real love looks like. And it could be you've got to the point of saying, I need to actually stand and acknowledge that. And there'll be opportunity a bit later whether you want to come forward for prayer at the ministry time or grab us afterwards. That is our most wonderful response because that is the invitation that comes. Now, without any great drama of of working through, let the, the work through. This is what lies ahead of you in the coming weeks as you look at the different churches. Each of them has a distinctive character and personality and various traits. I'm not going to go through all those. That's what lies ahead in the itinerary. But let me just get to... The first of those, to Ephesus. And I'm just going to read it. And I invite you perhaps to close your eyes and just to hear it. Hear it as God's living word that continues to speak through what he said to this church in Ephesus. So Christ says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, the seven churches. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles, but they're not. You have discovered that they are lies. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from among its place among the churches. 
But this is in your favour. You do hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans. They are a a fear-driven terrorist group. They are the radicalised extremists, just as I do. Anyone who have ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. And now hear this promise for those who hear and respond. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God.